but uh, two weeks ago we were in the book of Second Chronicles. Been there for a little while as we try to move through the Old Testament, and we are going to stop in, in Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and really dig in and spend a lot of time because those three books put you right where we are in in time. We talked about many times the order of the books in your Bible are extremely important for a number of reasons. The order of your books in the New Testament are in a specific order because if you actually go through and look what each book portrays to you, if, if you start specifically in the book of Romans and, and dealing with the church, if you look at the 13 epistles to the church, they lay out a specific series in a specific order that is important. But the cool thing is, is if you go through and you put them in a chronological order, because they're not in chronological order right now, they're in a a doctrinal order, they actually portray a, a whole different <laughs> setup that is important for believers to have as well. So if you look at the Old Testament, it, it is also in an extremely important specific order. And it's different than the Hebrew Bible. The order of books in the Old Testament take you all the way through a Christian's life. But it also takes you through a, a, a historical setup that also carries over to a prophetical setup. And the most notable of that is the fact that if you start in Kings and Chronicles, we look at the importance with uh, starting in Samuel, dealing with Samuel as the last judge and taking into Saul and to David and Solomon, how all that carries over into how Jesus Christ is going to be presented at the end of the, at the tribulation and all that, how all that craziness is going to play out. But for you and I, we understand that if you look at the order, Kings and Chronicles, that's going to represent the time period that we have been in over the last 2,000 years. And then it moves into Ezra, Nehemiah, those books deal with the nation of Israel regathering and rebuilding the city and rebuilding the temple. Well, they have been regathering since 1900. It became a nation in 1948, and since that point, it has been nothing but Israel, not necessarily rebuilding, because they haven't started that process yet, but regathering. And over the last five to ten years, that regathering has exploded. To the point now where they they actually have the plans of the third temple ready. They're actually pre-building the, the pieces of the third temple off-site. I mean, have you ever seen these, well, these huge warehouse buildings that they're building? You know what? I don't understand. Warehouse, companies that use warehouse, they're, they're backing off. Companies like Amazon and other other large corporations that are using these warehouses, they're actually backing out of leases that they've had over the next five to ten years because they don't need the warehouse space anymore. And yet we're building these monstrosity warehouse spaces at an astronomical rate. I don't understand it, but whatever. It's not my money, I guess. So, but have you ever seen these warehouse buildings being built? How do they bring in those walls? They bring them in on a flatbed trailer because they come in sections of about, I don't know, probably 10 to 12 feet wide, but however tall they need to be. They bring them in on a flatbed, they lift them off the flatbed with a crane, and they stand them up in place, and as they stand them, they weld them together, and then they, do, they, they build them all the way around, and then they set the roof on top. That's, based on what I've seen, that's how they're going to build the third temple in that, in that manner. They're building the wall sections off-site, and they're going to bring them on, and then they will stand those up and tack them all together. And the preparations for it's already underway. So Esther or Ezra and Nehemiah will be the rebuilding of Israel as a as a nation, the rebuilding of Israel as, as a city of Jerusalem, and the rebuilding ultimately of the temple. And then you get into the book of Esther. Esther will deal with the rapture of the church. And after the rapture of the church, we move into the book of Job. Now, there's some very, very coincidental scenarios with the book of Job. Obviously, we know Job is the persecuted one. But what's going to happen to the nation of Israel in the Great Tribulation? They're going to be persecuted. Job is 42 chapters long. 
the nation of Israel in the great tribulation will be persecuted for 42 months. Now, I say the great tribulation. The tribulation is going to be broken into two parts. It's, it's seven years total, roughly, probably just shy of that. The first half is false peace and false hope. The second half is what we call the time of Jacob's trouble, or the Bible calls the great tribulation, the time of God's wrath. It's 42 months, and it's the time that the nation of Israel is going to be, whoop, that little like that, uh, persecuted by the Antichrist for 42 months. And we'll talk a little bit about that this morning. So after you move out of the book of Job, what do we move into? We move into the longest book in your Bible, the book of Psalms talked about many times what is the what is the word that everybody nobody ever knows what it means but they always ask about in the book of psalms you just know selah means rest well what's the millennial reign all about it's about a period of rest for a thousand years when jesus christ sits on the temple sits on the mercy seat in the temple so the the order of books in the old testament lay out how God is going to work all through the all through time, basically. And so, as we begin this study in Ezra and Nehemiah, Esther, we're gonna we're gonna really dig in and deal with everything that's going on in the world around us right now. It has been for the last 123 years. But we're gonna start around 1900, and I'll, I'll show you why here this morning. But I want to start this morning by. A couple little interesting tidbits I found out this week. I just like to, I don't have a lot of time to read a lot of articles and such, but I just scroll through things and try to catch headlines. And, and if it's something I, I, I feel like I need to look into, I shared the one about our tourist out of Job chapter 38 on Thursday night. And I want to go to um, a few little passages here this morning as we open up. Because this, this sets the stage for everything. Go to um, Daniel chapter 11. I know you're going to love it. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel chapter 11. Now, in my personal opinion, Daniel chapter 11 verses 1 through 4 is where we are right now where we have it over the last several decades. But in Daniel chapter 5, it says 11, just sorry, Daniel chapter 11, verse 5, it says, And the king of the south <laughs> shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. Anybody know who the... Who the the leader of the king of the south is who basically represents the king of the south what nation who no egypt yes the united states will be found in my opinion now the king of the south is represented by egypt we get that out of ezekiel chapter 38 but i believe uh and it's taught very heavily in daniel chapter 7 that greece in your bible especially in prophecy, will represent the United States. So you've got the United States in 3 and 4, so you were close. But in 3 and 4, that kingdom dissolves away and splits into 4. And those 4 kingdoms that it dissolves into have nothing to do with the United States of America because it says at the end of verse 4, nor according to his dominion which he ruled. So whoever takes over world power after the United States ceases to be the world power will not be connected to the United States in any form or fashion. Now, those the four are probably, very likely, the king of the north, south, and east, and west. And so you have the king of the south pop up here, and it's Egypt from verse 5. Now, here's what's interesting, and I've mentioned this before. How much have you heard about Egypt in any time recently? Very little. So, you've heard a lot about the king of the north. That's headed up by Russia. And he's in this passage in Daniel chapter 11 from 5 mm -hmm. on. But you don't hear a lot about the king of the south. But if you read, and I'm not going to spend the time this morning doing it, but if you read from verse 5 down, you find out that first, the king of the south and the king of the north work together. But then something happens 
that brings strife between the North and the South, and they end up battling each other. They end up in some type of, if you want to call it a war or a battle, and it just so happens that they battle right over where Israel. They, they both basically meet halfway, and they battle there. But first, they have some kind of connection together. Lo and behold, out of nowhere this week, and I don't know when this particularly happened, but I found this. It says, Egypt secretly planned to send 40,000 rockets to guess who? Ukraine. No, not to Ukraine. Russia. To Russia fight against Ukraine. Is the beginning of the working together period beginning to happen? I don't know. But it's just, I love, I, I think one of the major things that you want to follow, if you want to keep up with Bible prophecy, is Egypt. <laughs> because Russia's been in the headlines forever. And, and so is Syria and Turkey and all these other, China. China, I believe, is basically the main player of the King of the East. Rome, King of the West. You hear about Rome all the time, but you don't hear a lot about Egypt. And out of nowhere, you, the, Egypt pops up, and guess who they're working with? King of the North, just like Daniel chapter 11 says they're going to. Now, here's a few things, a few interesting notes about Egypt. Egypt is mentioned 611 times in the Bible. Six, it, it, we know that Egypt represents the type of the world system as a Christian. Now, if you want to find some things out about a particular topic and you don't have a lot of time to delve into it on the forehand, here's what I recommend. First of all, look up how many times it's used in the scriptures. That'll tell you, what, you know, how important it is. You know that Jesus Christ is the number one discussed character in all the scripture? Anybody know who's second? Antichrist. The Antichrist. God, there's a lot of information God's trying to get out about the Antichrist. But 611 times, Pharaoh being one of the 18 types of the Antichrist in the Bible. 100 times in the book of Exodus, which you would figure. That's where Moses deals with, with Pharaoh and Israel and Egypt. 54 times in the book of Jeremiah. 43 in the book of Ezekiel and 35 in the book of Isaiah. Somebody tell me why that's important. Well, because Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah all deal with what? <clears throat> Future events. Egypt is going to be a major player in the tribulation period. Now, obviously, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and, and Isaiah are historical writings that were written about historical information, but when you begin to understand that those three books are major tribulation situations, you understand that Egypt is going to not only become part of future, they're going to become a major part of the future. Now here's the key if you, if you don't have a lot of time. The law of first mention. The law of first mention simply says, and it's it's not a law of God, necessarily. It's a law that Christians have come up to put together to say, if you want to know something, how God feels about a particular topic or a particular situation, you find the first time it's mentioned in the Bible. So, let's go to Genesis chapter 12 real quick. What's the first thing God says about Egypt? Or what's the first situation that Egypt appears in your Bible? Well, in Genesis chapter 12, in verse 10, it says, And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was grievous in the land, and it came to pass, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai, his wife, Behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. And da, da, da. basically what he ends up doing is telling her to lie, as in not telling the truth. So the first time Egypt shows up in your Bible is surrounding the fact that there is a famine in the land that God had intended to use for his people. And it's a, it's a place that 
Abraham and Sarah retreat to, and when they get there, they tell a lie. Take your own call on that, but to me, that doesn't look like a good scenario surrounding either. Now, here's another law. It's called the law of last mention. And look at Revelation chapter 11. And if you weren't convinced on the law of first mention, maybe this one will clear up some matters for you. In Revelation chapter 11, talking about the two witnesses, look down in verse 8. It says, and their dead bodies, okay, that's the two witnesses, shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called what? Sodom and Gomorrah? No. Sodom and Egypt. See what he just did? He put Egypt in what normally is Gomorrah. Liking, telling you and I that Egypt is likened to Sodom and Gomorrah. It's, it's trash. It's demonic. It's evil. By the way, as a side note, he's telling you how evil Jerusalem will be in the tribulation period by all the uh, unworthy sacrifices and all the satanic things that are going on in Jerusalem. Because the spiritual city he's talking about is Jerusalem there. Or the actual city. So, I say that to say this. The Bible does not have a very good view on Egypt. The other 609 references to Egypt in your Bible, most of them are negative. A few of them are neutral. I don't know that there's any positive connotations to Egypt in the Bible. So Egypt's got that going for it. And yet, here comes Egypt out of nowhere be a part of the player in the tribulation that they're going to be. Keep your eye on Egypt. So there was the first little thing I'd like to share with you. Here's the second little fun little fact that I found out this week. Um, Marla sparked my, my mind on Thursday night. You know, unfortunately, April 20th in, in our history hasn't been a very good, it is not just the United States, world history, has not been a very good date. Um, Columbine was on April 20th of 1999. The Oklahoma City bombing was on the 19th, but it was still in that particular area. And I know there have been other major events, and I don't have all of them. But an, a, one major event that cannot be looked over, because this gentleman was the last great type of the Antichrist. And if you don't believe me, I will show you. I have, I have a screenshot of it in my phone here, just so... When the government tracks me, they know that I, what I carry in my, uh, my cloud. This gentleman's badge number in the military. Anybody take a wild guess? No, I'm not. Five, 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 five. Six, six, six is reserved for somebody else. that's soon coming. Five, five, five. Anybody know what day that gentleman was born? April twentieth. Hitler. Hitler. What's that? He was on the 19th. See, there's another one. Put it in the put it in the file. That one in there. Hitler was the last great type of the Antichrist, not because his badge number was 555, but because he exterminated six million Jews. It's exactly what the Antichrist is going to do, only in a much larger number. The nation of Israel is going to go from wherever they, whatever their population is now, which I think they're close to back to 6 million, maybe even 7 or 8 now, down to 144,000. Guess who's going to be responsible for that? Yeah. Not 555-666. So I, I did a little study. Now, we talked on Thursday night about future events and particular timings that things may happen. Now, I always hesitate to do this because. I know, I know, but I still have to. Just say this. If 2027 ended up being the day, the year that the Antichrist sat on the throne in Jerusalem and claimed himself to be God, because a lot of stuff falls in line for that potentially to happen, three years prior to that, excuse me, that year, that year. 
2027. If you pull up April 20th of 2027, By the way, it would be the Kislev 25th in the Jewish calendar, which is their ninth month. And you go back to April 20th of that year, guess what day that comes up to be? The Sun or Abib, Jewish first month. Seven. 88, I believe, on their calendar from a B13 or the Psalm 13, which we know that 13 in your Bible is not a good number in my Bible, but it gets a little bigger than that. Regardless, regardless of what year, take this away. I don't care. The abomination of desolation based on history. I didn't make that date up based on history. That's the day Antiochus after the famous went into the temple in 168 BC and desecrated the temple. And three years later, the Jews partnered with the Maccabees and went in and reclaimed the temple. And we now have Hanukkah. Well, we don't. The Jews celebrate Hanukkah. It's just dedication. <laughs> this is legit. That's history. Okay? We know history repeats itself. Go back uh, that same year. We know the two witnesses out of Revelation chapter 11 are going to be here for 42 months. That, uh, that allows them to show up in the month of Eve, right around feast of, the end of Feast of Unleavened Bread, or right during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Well, the 13th is the day before his Passover. And I've always told you, I, I can guarantee that just like Jesus Christ had a triumphal entry on the 10th day of the Jewish first month, you better believe that the Antichrist is going to have a, I won't say triumphant because that's reserved for Jesus Christ. He's going to have a nice <coughs> welcoming committee party of his own. And I go back to this because I was, I was shocked when, when I saw this. How many of you have ever seen the, uh, the, the actual Aladdin movie where they had real bodies, not the cartoon one? where Will Smith played the genie. Oh, yeah. In that movie, whatever, what's Abu, or no, that's the King, King Ali, or whatever, the fake king, fake king, you hear me? The fake king, who's not really a king, who makes up a, a nation that he's king over. When they parade him into town to present him to the uh, Jasmine's dad, who is the king of whatever city they have, that whole scene. I mean, it's a parade. He comes right in on an elephant, and they got music, and there's dancing, and, and I was just shocked. I said, that's what it's going to be like. Antichrist is going to have his own entry party. And I guarantee it's going to be on the same day, the 10th, and that whole week, what we call Passion Week, that's going to be reserved for the Antichrist. That's going to be his christening. And that falls right in there. But it gets better. There's the book of Esther. I get to the actual Esther. <laughs> about this on, on Thursday night too, but I'm going to read this before I read the passage in Esther I want. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 1 says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Why? For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, that they shall not escape. It's they, they, that's Israel, not the church. Here's what he says to the church. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should not overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children of light. 
Verse 6, therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Showing us everything we need to know to be prepared. And he's not, he's not giving it to us through some pink-haired prophet on YouTube somewhere. Or he's not giving it to somebody who got a revelation from, you know, saying whoever. No, it's all in here, folks. Why do you think the devil has worked so hard over the last 125 years to get this out of the hands of Christians to the point now where people actually go to church now? Literally hundreds, if not thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people every Sunday just in the United States of America walk into church and don't even have this in their hand anymore. What? Or the pastor doesn't even use it anymore. That's like, hey, let me ask you guys. When you go to the job site on tomorrow morning, you're going to say, you know what? I don't need my tool belt. We'll figure it out when we get there. Yeah, how's that going to work for you? Or a mechanic showing up to the shop without his wrenches. Or you showing up to shop to work in the morning with no rig. You strap it on your back, pull that thing out to California. It makes sense. Ezra chapter 2. No, sorry, chapter 3. Watch. You know, Esther, yes, Esther, thank you. This is, what I, this is the part about preaching that I love. All I have to do is read. I don't have to make something up to make something fit. I just read. Look at verse 12. Let me, let me give you the back story, sorry. We talk about the 18 types of the Antichrist a lot. We talk about the 21 types of Jesus Christ a lot. One of the 18 types of the Antichrist is a man in the book of Esther by the name of Haman. And Haman's number one goal in the book of Esther was first to get rid of Mordecai. Mordecai was God's man. He was the picture of the Holy Spirit of God in the book of Esther. He was God's man. Haman wanted to exterminate Mordecai, but then beyond that, he didn't want to stop with Mordecai. Mordecai was just the first one on his list. He had an entire nation of people he wanted gone. I'll give you the guess of who that nation might have been. Yeah, Israel, the Jews. Watch what happens in verse 12. Then were the king's scribes, okay, the king is Ahasuerus, called on the didn't make it up. See, I didn't write the Bible. What day? Of what month? My goodness, there we are. And look what he was given. That there was written according to all that Haman had commanded under the king's lieutenants and governors that were over the province, and to the rulers of every people of every province, according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, in the name of King Ahasuerus, was it written and sealed with the king's ring? Okay, it was sealed. It was done. And Ahasuerus was turning this over to Haman. And the letters were set. Oh, notice what verse we're in. By post into all the king's provinces to destroy and to kill and to cause to perish. Who? The Jews. It's already all written out for you. If God doesn't have your attention to this point, I can't fix that. I don't know what else to do. Other than you, well, Larry said it. He wanted to change my title a little bit. So I appreciate that because I know where you were going with it. He wanted to say, have, have your house clean. You're spot on. Better have things in order. That's all I can say. Better have things in order. Now flip back to Second Chronicles. Now 
tell you what. All you have to do is going to tell you how I live. And I'm far from smart and far from special, and I just try to keep my eyes open. I try to keep my ears on. And I try to pay attention. Pay attention to the things that really matter. I don't care what the stock market's doing. I don't care what the banks are doing. I don't care about what I don't care. None of that stuff matters. Just pay attention. God is revealing everything. And there's no reason why we can't know where he's going to be, what he's going to be doing, and how he's going to be doing it. Site cleaning. That's what I want to talk about today. I, I had to take it out we talked a lot about the house cleaning. I had to take it out a step further. So I appreciate that we're on the same page. How many of you have ever moved? Maybe a few times. <clears throat> you know, yeah, that's that's great. We we lived in a house for twelve years. And I thought when we decided to move that not to be too bad, but it looks like we have that much stuff. Wow. In 12 years, it's amazing. It's what you can amass. you got to start the, the cleaning out process. Or how many of you ever uh, had a garage or a basement just full of junk, and even if you're not moving, it was time to straighten things up? I mean, you look at it and go, where do I even start? Or how about, how many of you ever built a house or had a house built for you or, or built anything where you had to go out and clear the ground? If you're watching yesterday, uh, that building off the grid shut off like that. And these people, they don't, they try to use, as some of them get a little carried away. I kind of think, you know, you're, you're pretending to live free electricity and all that, but yet all of a sudden they've got this huge dozer out there and you don't think that's how that works, but whatever. But these guys I was watching yesterday, they actually cleared by, they didn't have chainsaws, but they went in, they were in the mountains, the Great Smoky Mountains, and they had to go in and they cleared out about a 50 by 50 square that they were going to kind of make their homestead and house, so they had to go in and they cut down every tree and had to clear out all the stumps and all the good stuff. Well, that's what I want to talk about this morning. Site cleaning. And you got to go out, and even if even if it's a clear pasture, you can't just walk out there and throw a foundation down on the ground and expect that it's going to sit there and not move with the soil over time. You got to go out and you at least got to scrape the vegetation off. And you're going to have to bring in a little dirt or maybe cut a little dirt. You've got to get the, the ground flat. you got to set a good sub base. you got to come in. you got to trench out or peer out for, for piers or for footings. It's all about the site prep. You could build the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Somebody didn't do very good site prep on that old building. <laughs> Or that, that hotel that collapsed, where was that? In San Francisco or something here, maybe within the year? Florida. Okay, Florida. There's buildings in other places of the country that they have to monitor on a regular basis because these these huge high-rise condo buildings that they've built, and they're not, they didn't build a good enough footing for them, foundation, and this thing has sunk like two feet in some areas. And they have to monitor to make sure it's not going to fall too much more one way or the other in class. You could build the grandest, greatest building, but if you do not have the right site prep, it really doesn't matter. I mean, even the Bible gets into it and likens building on sand versus a solid rock. It says when the, when the waves of life come in and crash on your house built on sand, it's, it's gone. But they've, they've made some progress in the hurricane-stricken areas over the years, but now they've 
you know, they'll try to build these houses up on the piers and some of them get real smart. They do it on concrete piers to try to get them up off the ground. Because what happens to those houses that are sitting right on is basically the sand. Those hurricanes come in, I mean, it's no match. Not even, a, not even close. It's site prep. See, in Second Chronicles chapter 36, we're at the end of a particular period. Time at the end of the Kings. And we're getting ready to move into the book of Ezra. You know what Ezra is all about? It's all about building. Let's take Corinthians and then Chronicles. Second Chronicles. So what Israel has to do is begin the preparation process of cleaning the site. Now, in between 2 Chronicles 36 up until uh, verse 22, everything prior to 22, there's a 70-year gap. 70 years Israel was captive in Babylon, the book of Daniel. The last two weeks ago, we talked about chapter 36, verse 7, when Nebuchadnezzar came in and carried away all the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon. We talked about how that relates over to us spiritually. The devil's after our mind, trying to take our mind captive. But I want to pick it up in verse 9 this morning. But I do want to mention, look at verse 3 real quick. Notice there's another player in this. And the king of who? Remember, this time period that we are reading about prophetically ties into where we are right now in 2023. And who's in the middle of it? Amongst Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. We know Babylon's going to be a major player based on Revelation. Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, right in the middle of it, she's got Egypt as well. Oh, and by the way, in case you're wondering, Mystery Babylon is the king of the West. That's Rome. They're all there. They're all there. King of the East pops up in Revelation as well. So, kind of Bible trivia for a second. When does the King of the East come into play in tribulation? What what major event happens on this world that allows the King of the East to come across? The river tied to it. Euphrates. Yes. The Euphrates dries up. Somebody go do a little Google search when you get home and See how that old river Euphrates is holding up right now. It's dried up. <clears throat> All right. Second <coughs> Chronicles, chapter 36. I'm going to pick it up in verse 9, but I'm going to pray before I do. Father God, we thank you so much for today. Father, we, we just thank you that you give us this solid book of truth. Lord, this old world is spinning around us so fast, there's no way we can keep up with everything that's changing it is changing at such a rapid pace. But God, one thing that never changes is you, your son, and your word. And Lord, I pray this morning that as we continue to, to look at these events all the way back in 600, the 7th century B.C., God, that you would continue to help us to see how that's exactly what is going on around us right now. It's what, what we're reading in this particular part of the Bible is not all the, the crazy circumstances that, that as we see going on, this is what's really happening. And I pray, God, that you help keep our minds focused on the real events that matter and keep our minds focused on you through this particular time, Lord. We thank you for all you do for us. We love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Just real quickly to catch you up, verse 8 says, Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim, and his abominations which he did, and that which was found in him, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah, and Jehoiachin, his son, reigned in his stead. Okay, Jehoiakim was the king. He did evil. After Nebuchadnezzar comes in and boots him off the throne and takes all the vessels of the temple out, Jehoiachin, who is Jehoiakim's son, takes over and becomes king. Now flip over to Jeremiah chapter 24 real quick. Sorry, I know we're doing a bunch of jumping, but you got to. Told you. The, current, the, the order of the books are important. 
for a specific reason. But when you understand the chronology of the way the books are written, it also sheds a whole new light on things as well, too. Now, understand this. We are right around 6, 607 B.C. in what we're reading in 2 Chronicles. But understand this also. Jeremiah, and I can print more of these off. They're kind of small to read. But I, I put you a, a chronology of the uh, prophets in here. Jeremiah was written around 629 B.C. So he is foretelling the events that are playing out at the end of Second Chronicles and from the events in Daniel. He's foretelling those events. He's pre-writing. So he's going to tell you something interestingly interesting about Jehoiachin, the son of Jehoiakim, in Jeremiah chapter 24. Uh, look specifically in verse, um, oh, I'm sorry, 22. And we're going to pick it up, interestingly enough, in verse 13. He says, Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by wrong, that useth his neighbor's service without wages and giveth him not for his work, that saith, I will build me a wide house and large chambers and cutteth him out windows, and it's sealed uh, with cedar and painted with uh, vermil vermilion. Shalt thou reign because thou closest thyself in cedar? Did not thy father eat and drink and do judgment and justice? And then it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well with him. Was not this to know me, saith the Lord? But thine eyes and thine heart are not but for thy covetousness and for uh, to shed innocent blood and for oppression and for violence to do. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning Jehoiakim the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament for him, saying, All my brother or all sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, All Lord or all his glory. He shall be buried with him, the burial of an ass and drawn and cast forth beyond the gates of Jerusalem. That's what got Jehoiakim in trouble. He brought no glory to God. He brought no glory to the house of the Lord. Then it says in verse 20, Go up to Lebanon and cry, and lift up thy voice in Bashan, and cry from the passages, for all thy lovers are destroyed. But I spake unto thee in the pro and by thy prosperity, but thou saidest, I will not hear. This hath been my manner from thy youth, that thou obeyest not my voice. The wind shall eat up all thy pastors, and thy lovers shall go into captivity. Surely then shalt thou be ashamed and confounded for all thy wickedness. O inhabitants of Lebanon, that makest thy nest in the cedars, how gracious shalt thou be when pangs come upon thee, the pain of a woman, as of a woman in travail. Okay, time out. Somebody tell me, if, I didn't, if you didn't know where I was reading about, what this could be applied to. Think modern. Does this not sound like the description that God gives of the church in Revelation chapter 3 in the Laodicean church period? I mean, he doesn't get into that kind of detail in Revelation chapter 3, but he calls the church lukewarm. And he says he's going to spew thee out of his mouth if they don't get themselves turned around. Does not exactly what is happening with Jehoiakim sound like exactly the mess that the church has got itself into because instead of giving God the honor and the glory in all things that are happening we turn and we give honor and glory to everything else music or whatever history repeats itself and so look what happens to the nation of Israel because of this stance that they have with God. In verse 24, he says, As I live, saith the Lord. Now, he says, Though Kaniah, the son of Jehoiakim. That wasn't his name. What was his name in Second Chronicles? It was Jehoiachin. Only now it's Kaniah. Or Jeconiah was another name for Je Je uh, uh, Jehoiakim. 
But now his name is Kenai. You know what Kenai means? It means despised, broken, idol. That's how God sees Israel now. They're a despised, broken idol. And notice what happens because of this rebellion in verse 28. It says, is this man, Kaniah, a despised, broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, and are cast into the land which thou know not? O oh, earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. You know what just happened right there? God took away the Messiah out of the line of the tribe of Judah. No more was the, the line of the tribe of Judah going to come through the bloodline of the kings of Israel. He got cut off right there. Now this, that was written at least 20 years prior to what you're reading in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. And that's important to understand because God always tells you and I exactly what he's going to do before he does it. There are no surprises with God. There should be no surprises in the life of a Christian. Everything is spelled out exactly the way God says it was going to work. Now look at verse 9. Jehoiachin, that's Kaniah now, was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now this is kind of, this is kind of cool. The book of Ezra will pick up around 1900 A.D. In recent history. If you take the the period of time that uh, based on the age, no, this this is right, three months and ten days. If you work on a 360 day calendar, and you take three months and ten days, do you know how many days that comes out to be exactly? Now, that, that must have been his eight years old, too. Could have wrote down all my math. It's 1,900 days. I can go back and do the math and figure out exactly how to came up with that. But. And Ezra picks up right around 1,900 A.D. Now, does that matter? Probably not. But is it cool? <laughs> Jehoiachin was the king that took over for Jehoiakim, his dad. He only reigned for three months and ten days. And it was in that short time period, time span, time period, that God turned everything around for the nation of Israel and not the good way. Everything got turned on its head to the point where even Jesus Christ was cut off from coming out of the line of the tribe of Judah. Sometimes it doesn't take long. Sometimes we can make such a mess of things in our lives. Sometimes we can, we can think we're doing what we should be doing, but in all reality, if our life is not bringing honor to God and glory to God, And we can make a mess of things quickly. You know how long it took Israel to turn around a three months and ten day reign that was evil? Seventy years. Mm -hmm. Let me figure out how many days that is. I think it's like 25,000 something. Now after Debit, or after uh, Jehoiakim rules, he gets taken off the throne, and Nebuchadnezzar instills a man by the name of Zedekiah. 
Zedekiah was not really a king. He was just kind of a figurehead. And he rules for 11 years. Now look at verse 14. Moreover, all the chiefs of the priests and the people have transgressed very much after the abomination of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which had hallowed, he had hallowed in Jerusalem. I mean, it is just one mess after another mess after another mess after another mess. Let me show you something else that falls interesting in this particular time. Go to Isaiah chapter 45. And I'll read it so you don't have to turn there right now if you don't want to. Again. This has no bearing on the person. It has every bearing on the event. Now, at the end of the 70 years, there's going to be a king that releases Israel from the bondage under Nebuchadnezzar. And it's going to be Cyrus. And he's prophesied about over here in the book of Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was written... Um, <coughs> all the way back around 760 B.C. And he's writing about events that are going to take place around 539. So over 200 years. Now look what he says in Isaiah chapter 45. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two uh, uh, leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. <coughs> 200 years before God already says I have a man anointed that's going to release my people now please hear what I'm saying this is not the person the individual it has nothing to do with the individual it has everything to do with the event it just so happened that somebody had to fill that spot. I think they're all a mess. I think they're all bought and sold and paid for. Yes. But it just so happens that the individual who began the process of giving all of Israel, specifically Jerusalem, back to the nation of Israel, fell under the person who held the office of the 45th president of the nation that is currently, for the time being, still the world power. And it just so happened that God used the 45th chapter to explain that Israel was going to be free both historically and to some degree prophetically. I just show those things because I don't think there's coincidences in the Bible. Everything is there for a purpose. Now, in verse 9 and in verse 12, you find out that Everything is evil surrounding the nation of Israel at this particular time. And we saw in Jeremiah chapter 22 the repercussions of that. You had to bring this to a particular time period for now. This is going to be the period of the church and the final days of the church. In verse 14, I'm going to read it again. It says, Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by the messengers uh, rising up at times and sending. 
because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. What he's saying in verse 15 is even though Israel's in a mess, God is still sending folks to try to get them squared away. Those are the prophets. There's always a remnant. God is still working. Even as we stand here and speak this morning, there are still people that need to hear the message of Jesus Christ. There are still people who are seeking truth. Maybe they're believers, maybe they're not, but they're still seeking some sort of truth in their life. In Psalm 25, 14, it says, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. You know what you and I are like right now in comparison to the Old Testament period? We're like the prophets. Now, we prophesy out of this book. But we're the last group of folks that God has instilled to say, hey, <clears throat> do what you can do. It's it's like the, we're on a, if this was a, a graph, we're on a trajectory like this. We're falling quick. But whatever we can do in this fall to try to create some type of peak of, of truth to save as many people as we can to, to allow people to still find hope. That's what we're sent for. You know, people that seem to have problems in their Christianity or problems in their life, now, some of us just going to come by attrition. We live in a cursed world. But you know what I think the best solution for somebody that's struggling with things in their life? Yes, prayer. Prayer is extremely important. The Word of God, extremely important. You always, whether you're struggling or not, you got to have those two. But you know what I think the greatest fix for somebody struggling with something in their in their life? Go minister to somebody else. Get out on the street and just talk with people. Work with people. Because you know what you're going to find out real quick about your life? It ain't near as bad as what you thought. Man. You know, there was an old saying when I was growing up in sports. No matter how good you think you are, there's somebody always better. Somebody's always out working you. Somebody's always out doing you. Well, the same is true when it comes to life. As bad as you think your life is, as bad as you think your situation is, somebody's always got it worse. Somebody's always dealing with something greater. Yeah. Now, I feel bad for the person that's at the end of that road. But it's there somebody else. And that's exactly what verse 15 is all about. God is still using those of us who want to be used. God will still, Psalm 25, 14, he will reveal the things to you and I that we need to know. That's why I share these things like this. And we, many of us have talked about it many times. When you start talking to people that are so far, Christians, I'm talking about Christians now. When you start talking about talking to Christians about some of this stuff, about end times and how close we are and how things are going, and boy, they look at you like you, they just saw an alien. John chapter 16, verse 13 says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Then there's a colon. says, and he will show you things to come. You get in tune with the Holy Spirit of God. See, you're in one of two places with the Holy Spirit at all times. You're either grieving the Holy Spirit of God because bottom line is you're refusing to do what God's asking you to do. If you want to find out what grieving the Holy Spirit is, you just look God in the eye and say, I'm going to do it my way. Or, you're walking in tune with the Holy Spirit of God. 
You're seeking the Holy Spirit of God. And when you're doing that, he says he will guide you into all truth. And you know what happens when you get guided unto all truth? He will show you things to come. Verse 25, 2. Mark mentioned this verse the other day. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Now, he's not going to just come down and say, you've been saved for 30 years now. You've been saved for 20 years. Here, have all of this. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, to study thy, to show thyself approved unto God. Psalm 25, 2 says that it's an honor to kings to search out a matter. Search it out. He's still given. He's still freely given. Freely you have received, freely give. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by the messenger, rising up at times and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. You know what that verse tells Do you realize the mess that Israel's in right here? He just cut off Jesus Christ from coming through the line of kings that he promised he would come through. And yet it says he still has compassion on his people, so he's still giving them. He's still giving. Until that trumpet blows, until the rapture takes place, God's still giving to those that want him. He's going to use you and I to give it to him. I talked about on Thursday night. I mean, maybe this is maybe I'm just being uh, partial because I'm alive right now, but. I think being alive at the first advent would have been wild. It would have been an honor. It would have been an honor to see Jesus Christ. I would like to think I would have been there when he came out of the tomb, but nobody else was, so why would I have been any different? But it would have been an honor to see the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. There's some times in history, I think the, the toughest people, are the Christians that lived in the Dark Ages from 500 to 1500 that got persecuted and martyred by the Roman Catholic Church? I mean, the things, if you go back and read some of those stories and some of the things that those people endured, oh my goodness, those would have had to be some of the toughest people the world has ever seen. But I personally think, and I, I wouldn't put myself up against those people for toughness by any stretch of the imagination. I fold like a cheap tent. That's quite an honor for God to have chosen us to be the last line of defense for him, for his son, before this whole thing blows up. And I, I mean, I'm not saying it's tomorrow. I'm not saying it's three years. It could still be 40 years away. I got my opinion on it. But regardless, Jesus Christ says in Matthew 24 that the generation that's alive to see the fig tree put forth yet its green leaves will not pass away. And we are, what, 74 years or something like that into the generation since 1948. What an honor. What are we going to do with it, though? It's not just an honor to be here. The honor comes from being chosen by God to actually go out and do what he wants us to do for his sake at the time he gave us left. Now look at verse 16. He says, but they mocked the messengers of God. Yes, they will. They will mock you. They're spitting on you now. They are punching you now. If you go to Jerusalem right now, there's a chance you get thrown in prison for even saying the name of Jesus. They despised his words. Yes, they do. And misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people. Now, what's the word wrath in your Bible mean? It means tribulation. When you see the word wrath, it's a doctrinal 
foreshadowing of the tribulation period, the, seven, the actual seven year tribulation period. God is going to do everything he can until he just can't take it anymore. Because he actually says that at the end of the verse. Till there was no more. He just can't take it anymore. Revelation chapter 3. He will spew thee out of his mouth. He's done. Now on the flip side of it. Being an honor to be here as a Christian. Could you imagine being the generation. That finally causes God to say. I can't take it anymore. Boy is there going to be a judgment. Now, I know we're out of time. But interestingly enough. The next thing that shows up in verse 17, therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees. That's Nebuchadnezzar, folks. That's the king of Babylon, the Antichrist. Notice that when God can't take it anymore, guess who shows up? The Antichrist. Proverbs 4, verse 7 says this, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. There's a difference between wisdom and understanding. Wisdom is knowledge applied. You read a verse and you apply it to your life. That's wisdom. But understanding is understanding how it applies to everything God has given. Understanding the time period we live in. Understanding your role as a Christian in this particular time that we live in. Get wisdom and with all thy getting, get understanding. Please understand what's going on. Please understand your role in what's going on. Please understand the urgency of the hour of the people that are lost out there right now. Psalm 17, 1 says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. We have an obligation. It should be a an honor of an obligation. But we do have an obligation as a servant of Jesus Christ in this particular time that we find ourselves in. Perfect love casts without fear. There is no fear. Where, 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 where are the spiritual crown that God has given us as Christians right now? With excitement, with joy. But you can't video it unless you get the site clean. <laughs> Next week we're going to jump into the first chapter of Ezra. Everything in Ezra and Nehemiah is about one thing. Rebuilding the city and the temple back to God. But before they do that, they have to clean the site. They have to clean up the mess that God's people did at the end of Chronicles and during the time of the book of Daniel, the 70 year captivity. So I, my call to you this week, my call to myself this week is go through your sight. Trim down the trees, grind up the stumps, tear out the weeds, clean it up. So when we show up next week and we get into the period where the migration back to Israel starts for, for, uh, for the Israelites and the Jews, you and I spiritually can begin the migration back to exactly where God wants us to be. All right, Father, thank you so much for everything you do for our lives. And Lord, to some it may seem crazy that there are repetitive scenarios in the Old Testament of church, 
end of the church period, tribulation, second heaven. Then we read a little more, and it's end of the church period, tribulation, second heaven. The God, the whole purpose of it is for you. What it was was you showing us how important the whole process is going to be, and how important it is that we heed to the understanding that we have to get ourselves where we need to be in preparation, both spiritually and physically. Well, my prayer this morning is that we look at the end of the time of the kings for the nation of Israel. We saw that the complete, utter destruction and, and disarray and, and just filthiness and sin and unrighteousness and unholiness. Lord, to the point where they allowed a, a king who worshipped false idols and false gods that you warned about so many times to come into your holy temple and have rule and reign. Why couldn't it happen to the church? Why couldn't it happen to a Christian? Well, we have to protect ourselves against it. Lord, my prayer is as we build in the next week, as we begin the process of looking what takes place in Ezra and how it played in historically, but how it played in, in recent history and how it plays into where we are right now in 2023. May God, you help us to have a clear heart and clear mind so that, God, we can begin the process of making sure the holy temple that you have given us in our body is exactly adorned the way it needs to be and furnished exactly the way it needs to be. We thank you for all that you do for us. We love you so much. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, let's close out with...